Hello everyone, welcome back to Hashtag from the Cardboard's channel. If you watched the previous video, now you understand how a single camshaft is signed, open and closes the valves, the push rods, hydraulic lifters, and rocker arms. Today's video, just like I promised, is going to be about the overhead camshaft design. I have two different setups, the overhead camshaft, single overhead camshaft, and I have two of the most popular ones. The engine your vehicle may may not have one of these two. Uh, just like anything else, every manufacturer is going to have different variations. However, once you understand this, it won't matter what kind of configuration your car has you'll know what the parts are and what they do. So just like the previous videos, I'm going to bring the camera up close so I can explain what the parts are and what they do. So let's get started. So to get started, we're going to go over the parts real fast. So we have the camshaft sprockets right here. We have the camshafts, two of them because this is the dual overhead camshaft, which is D-O-H-C. If you see that on top of your valve cover, D-O-H-C is dual overhead camshaft. If you didn't know, now you do. Right underneath the camshafts, you're going to have the hydraulic lash adjusters, then your valve springs, then the valves, and obviously you got your crankshaft, and no different than before, I didn't draw it this time, but you got your connecting rod and your piston. If you watched the previous video, you noticed that there was a single camshaft in the center of the engine, and a timing chain was used to go around the camshaft sprocket and the crankshaft sprocket to operate it. This is slightly different design, it uses a timing belt. The timing belt has to have its proper adjustment, so there's always going to be at least one timing belt tensioner and at least one idler, sometimes there'll be more. And a timing belt needs to be replaced anywhere from 60 to 90,000 miles depending on the vehicle. If you don't change the timing belt within that period of time, what's going to happen is, since it's made out of rubber, it's going to get brittle and eventually it's going to snap. And the problem with that is, when the timing belt snaps, the crankshaft continues rotating, you know, whenever you try to start your engine, it's going to rotate. So the pistons that are attached to the crankshaft are going to continue to go up and down. But since there's nothing connecting the camshafts anymore, since this broke, the valves are going to remain at whatever position they were at the time. So for instance, this one is open right here. You see the camshaft load pushing down? At that point, this valve is lower than the rest, and when the piston goes up, if it's an interference engine, what it's going to do is it's going to bend it. And this could happen on several cylinders depending on where the valves were whenever this timing belt snapped. So if you go ahead and install a brand new belt and you try to start your engine, there's a possibility that several cylinders won't have any compression because it'll be escaping through the bent valves. So the only way to repair that damage is going to be to remove the cylinder head completely, do an entire valve job, and replace the bent valves with new ones. So if you didn't know what kind of intervals you have between replacement of timing belts, now you do look in your manual, find out if your vehicle has a timing belt or a timing chain, and figure out how many miles it has. If you buy it new, it's easier to find out. If you buy it used, it's a little bit harder. But to be safe, honestly, if you buy a used vehicle and it's getting close to 90,000 miles, go ahead and replace this timing belt. Do yourself a favor because if you don't, you're going to create so much damage that it's going to cost thousands of dollars. And another thing too, a lot of people trying to save money will replace only the timing belt and they will not replace the tensioner, the idler, and sometimes the hydraulic tensioner that is attached to here, right here. I didn't draw it, but what, what it looks like, something like this, it's a cylinder, it's attached with two bolts, and there is a hydraulic item that comes here and it pushes against a bracket that is built within the tensioner, okay? So there's another part that is common to find or sometimes it'll be just a spring, okay? So depending on the design. It can be either or, a hydraulic tensioner or a spring. So regardless, when you're replacing this timing belt, you need to replace everything and sometimes companies make what they call a timing belt kit. It'll come with everything. New timing belt, idler, tensioner, hydraulic unit, spring, and a lot of times even a brand new water pump because there are times that the water pump is internal and is operated by the timing belt. So it'll come with it. That way you can drive your vehicle for another 90,000 miles, don't have to worry about a thing, and it'll be working like brand new. So now that we know about the parts involved, how does this operate differently than the single camshaft? Well, I already said that the single camshaft have push rods, have rocker arms that push the valves down, right? This one, as you can tell, camshaft is directly on top of the valves. 
super efficient way to do it. There's a lot less moving parts. This engine can spin at a higher RPMs and less likely of parts breaking because everything is right there. So the lobe is right on top of the hydraulic lash adjuster and the spring is, is underneath. So obviously as it rotates, it's gonna move it. You know, this is spring loaded, so it's always gonna have pressure against it. So whenever the heel of the camshaft lobe goes like this, it's gonna move the valve down, which is open. And obviously we already know this happens thousands of times per minute. So that is this setup with a timing belt, dual overhead head camshaft. So now that we know how this setup works, I'm gonna move the camera down to explain how the single head camshaft design works. And to make it even better, I have a design that uses a timing chain instead of a timing belt. Okay, so just like I said, this one, instead of using a timing belt, uses a timing chain. This setup is very common on Toyota 22R engines and other vehicles, of course. The 20 and 22R Toyotas were built for a long, long time. So those pickups, they're still around. They seem to last forever. Very, very efficient design. So this one has a single overhead camshaft. This setup has rocker arms. There are no push rods, but there are rocker arms. This one has a mechanical last adjuster, so you can adjust the valves through here. There's a nut that keeps it tight, and then you use a flat screwdriver to move it up and down, and it makes contact with the valve right here, and this is where you adjust the valves. Then you're gonna have a valve spring, a valve, you have your camshaft, you got your rocker arm shafts, you know, one for each side, you have your camshaft sprocket, you got your timing chain, and sometimes you may even have this set up, and sometimes this setup can be found using a timing belt instead of a timing chain for some of the Japanese vehicles. So, not necessarily a timing chain all the time, but it's the most common. There's still a lot less moving parts than the push rod design, even though you have rocker arms, they're right next to the camshaft. So it's easy whenever the camshaft rotates to the same thing to tilt them and whenever they tilt obviously they push the valve down and they open it and just like I said this is where you adjust them. You adjust it when the engine is cold, you warm it up and you adjust them again and obviously when you adjust them it needs to be when the valve is closed. You know that means that whenever the camshaft lobe is right here is when you adjust them. If you try to adjust them when the heel of the camshaft lobe is already opening them and it's putting pressure against the rocker arm the clearance is going to be so messed up that your engine may not even run at all. You're going to have to have the valve cover removed anyways to do it. So very simple, just look. You know, as long as the, the lower part of the lobe is touching the rocker arm, and that's it. You know, you adjust it, then you turn your engine, you move on to the rest, and you don't even have to worry about, you know, where the piston is at. At that point, it's irrelevant. You're looking at the camshaft. That's all you care about right now. So very, very simple to adjust the valves on this setup. And like I said earlier, these two are two of the most common ones. There are more with slightly different variations. But like I said earlier, if you understand these two designs, you're going to understand any other single or dual overhead camshafts. And there you go. Now you know how the dual overhead camshaft and single overhead camshaft design opens and closes the valves. What I'm going to do in a different tutorial is explain camshaft profiles. This way we can continue with the camshaft subject and it will be fresh. That way you'll understand it better. So thanks for watching. See you next time.